All right, here's what you gotta do. I actually saw that you had dropped a bit of yogurt on your shirt, Manu, but I was waiting to tell you until we started the episode. I was going to make fun oh, of you. I was never so going to tell him. Plan I just failed. wanted it to linger there and for him to not notice throughout the entire oh, episode. Oh, it just bug the entire audience. <laughs> not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> you guys are the worst. Well, hello, Bananas. I am Captain Banana today. And with me, I have my subordinate. Say hello, Liam. Hello, hello Liam. That's hello, Liam. And my subordinate number two. To oh, Manu. we're both funny at the same time. Look at us. Hello. I don't think either of us were funny at that time. <laughs> no, but we both tried really hard. I don't think we're ever funny. <laughs> we are also, on a rare occasion, all wearing shades of black. We're like 50 shades of black today. Yeah, can you guys stop with that? And I'm charcoal. As we've spoken about, that's kind of my thing. It's the only thing I have. <laughs> it's the only thing I have. You guys all have other colors. Black is the only thing I have. I'm like that guy they cast for the flash. Flashback scene of your biography, Liam. <laughs> I'm like, let's just get that guy. <laughs> Flashback, but to play me at, in my mid 20s. <laughs> yeah, put him in a black t shirt. It'll yeah, yeah, work. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, Liam was going through a very fuckboy phase then. This was his raving days. Fuckboy yeah, raver. Yeah, well, it happens. The fuckboy phase or the rave? What can all this dust? Are you going to be going through a raving phase soon, Manu? Yeah, I'm feeling it. It's, uh, it's bubbling up. It's like a bit of a like a mm. like a rash. You can kind of feel it developing. Ah, uh, yeah, rave rash. Uh, that's a nasty one. Yeah, it's like herpes. There's only one way to get rid of it, and it's to keep going to raves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Spread it around. It could happen. Have, all serious <laughs> question though. Have you actually ever been a raver, or no. do you like enjoy? Do you enjoy going to raves, festivals? No. You? What about you, Sophie? No. I I used to enjoy festivals when I was younger, but not anymore. Oh, young. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't mind going, but it was just. I think COVID just changed everything. I do like festivals. I it's just not not rave festivals per se. I would agree, rave festivals. There's been a few in Sydney lately that all of my friends have gone to and I'm going through my Instagram stories like, people still go to raves? I can feel it in my knees, you know? I can feel it in my, like, in my achy bones. It doesn't feel very COVID safe. <laughs> oh, I mean, COVID doesn't really exist anymore. Aren't raves, isn't that like under the bridge? No, they're usually like in an actual venue, like street raves are, are quite rare. I'm just teasing you. I thought this might be like a German custom and I was trying trying to respect it. Okay, well that failed. I mean, like on the on the big event thing though, I mean, Oktoberfest just happened when I left. Oh, uh, true, and you missed it. Yeah, I really wanted to go. But you didn't want to get infected. I mean, I just had it, but then I was like, if I get it again while I'm traveling, that might suck. Despite my horrendous fear of people, Oktoberfest is something that I absolutely want to go to one year. It just sounds like fun. It's good for you. Thank like you. they make it easy for introverted people by just drinking a lot of alcohol, they become extroverted. Yeah, no, exactly, <laughs> perfect. That, that's perfect. That's it's so much different than most social interactions. So is that what you're telling me, Liam? All we have to do is get you drunk? Maybe we can still go to film red screening, but I'll just get you super drunk beforehand. That'll be I great. Yeah, and then I'll have like pictures of Grand Line Review drunk popping up on Reddit the next morning. Arsehole influencer turns up intoxicated. Where's your million subscribers? <laughs> I have to make my first apology video. Liam <laughs> up on stage, bow to your king. <laughs> Crunchyroll, this is the Grand Line Review. Who do you think you are? Crunchy, what? I own this place. It's a thought. We should do it. So, uh, Sophie, what have you uh, prepared for us today? What have I prepared? Well, you mentioned Oktoberfest and that you were traveling, Manu. And I am going to be going traveling very, very soon. And I have a bit of, a bit of a fear because I know that I won't be able to keep up my YouTube content as I would like to. Oh no, right after your explosive growth. First video that got 100k views recently and now I'm going to abandon my channel for a couple of weeks. I mean, I am planning on still doing content, but I just don't know. I just don't know how it's going to work. I actually heard a very interesting anecdote while I was traveling from uh, another YouTuber who shall be un unnamed because I don't know if he wants that shared, but he has, I think, three or four million subscribers and he had the exact same problem as you. So he published a banger video and then uh, was going going to be away for like a month and he was very stressed whether he should just make like random small videos to fill the gap 
but then decided not to, and the next video did even better after he took a break. Nice. But does it make up for the for the gap? Well, I mean, if if the goal is money, then no. If the goal is momentum, then yes. And at least it's not a loss. I'm glad to hear that at least it didn't suffer. I feel like it would depend on the genre as well. And obviously we probably can't reveal that without going into identity, but yeah. yeah. We'll talk later. <laughs> I will say though, um, I've discussed it with other people and um, it seems like the data seems to, because apparently YouTube actually ran a, ran a study whether or not consistency plays a role in performance and it does not. Is is that public? I'm not sure if it's public. I feel like Liam would have, must have a big counter to this. <laughs> like maybe not algorithmically, but I feel like in terms of just human behavior, consistency absolutely would play a part because you become a part of, you know, people's like daily lives. Subconsciously develop spots for you. Well, that depends what your goal with your channel is. To become a part of their daily lives. <laughs> to inject them with the drug that is One Piece. Yeah, but not everyone is like you, Liam. What? That's not everyone's goal. But you're all wearing Wearing dark shirts. I am, but not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair enough. It does depend entirely on your goal. And even then, I think I have discussed before, I don't know if I've said it on a podcast, but I think I've shared with both of you before that I think with you, Manu, even though you release less than Liam does, the reason, like, I would imagine why a part of why, a part of why your videos do so well is because of the reduced amount of videos that you release in a week. The scarcity. Yeah, there's a scarcity effect that people are like, oh, okay, Manu's released the video, I need to watch it. Like if you don't drink all week and then on Friday someone offers you a glass of water, you're like, oh, I gotta gobble down that O'Hara. Well, my personal theory is a bit different. I don't think it's a scarcity per se. I think if you have a banger video and you upload a banger video every day and you can deliver a banger video every day, then you should upload a banger video every day. So much banging. That's a lot of banging in there. I just think I have, I mean, I just have a little bit more time than Liam to work on the videos. It's just a, like, given the time, I just have a bit more time to polish stuff. And I think it's just that slight difference in, in production, I guess. I think you're being a bit modest there. I think it's quite a, a gaping chasm of production difference. <laughs> No, I wouldn't go that far. We should start a tally on how many times Liam uses the word gaping this year. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Why have we not started this tally yet? If I'm talking about a chasm, it's always going to be gaping. Understood. Must be gaping. Why doesn't quite portray what I want it to? I mean, I'm not too worried because I do plan on making videos whilst I'm away. But even if I don't, I do really want to use this time to relax and just rest, which is... Unusual for your year. <laughs> yes, unusual for me especially but I'll tell you why I need this rest just before we went to Melbourne Liam so this is you know a while ago now I had probably the most stressful couple of weeks I was studying it was getting to like assessment periods a lot of things were getting due and it was crunch time at work at multiple places at work and I was also taking care of the channel by myself for a period. I had to do all the editing, which you guys know, I usually don't have to do myself, but I was doing all the editing as well. And I was super stressed out and I didn't really realize it because I'm, my personality is sort of just like, just get on with it and move on um, and just sort of just go through the the like the grunt really but then my body was telling me in unexpected ways that I was really stressed how unexpected <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you guys what weight was I was having these in really intense really vivid and very disturbing dreams and I had a series of like three or four within the span of like 10 days. And I won't tell you all of them, but two of them I'll tell you because I think they were, one of them was, was the scariest one that I, that really woke me up and thought, okay, Sophie, you really, you really need to calm down and relax now because obviously, <laughs> obviously you're not coping very well. And that one was in the span of a dream, I got robbed twice. <laughs> <laughs> like in the span of one stuff left dream. The time. <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't even know I still had stuff on me, but But the things that were being stolen were just the most bizarre things. The first time I was going for a walk and I stopped by at a canteen and bought a sandwich. And for a very special reason, that sandwich was selling, uh, that canteen was selling gluten-free bread. And I thought, gluten-free bread, I have to get this sandwich. So I bought that gluten-free bread and I was walking home really happy with myself that I was able to score a gluten-free sandwich. And on the way, someone stole my sandwich. No. But at knife point, at no. knife point. Come here. <laughs> like, it was really intense 
And I was like, you know, why? And I couldn't even blame the man. In my dream, I, the way that my thought process went was, you know what? Yeah, inflation ra like rates are really rising in Australia right now. It's really crap. The Reserve Bank just raised inflation by 0.5%. That man needs this sandwich. I, I was just thinking, this, this is how dire situations have gotten, you know? This is the point that, you know, life has gotten, that people are stealing sandwiches from each other at knife point. So I gave him the sandwich and I don't know why I couldn't get picked up afterwards, but I still continued on my merry way until the dream turned into nighttime. And then when I sat by, I, because I didn't get to eat my sandwich, I was really hungry. So I stopped by at a restaurant. God, and the sandwich is such a cohesive <laughs> dream. As I was waiting, as I was waiting to get my food, another man robbed me of five dollars. That's not much given the inflation. I was hoping it would be the same man <laughs> if I'm honest with you. No. Like a recurring character. <laughs> this is where my dream took a turn and the same man who stole my sandwich actually ended up helping me. No way! Karma. Dream karma. Right. He sat down with me and then made sure that I was all right. He didn't return my sandwich but he, ret he sat down with me until he knew for sure I was going to get home safely and I thought that was pretty nice. Well, I imagine the sandwich was no more at that point. I imagine so too. He was like like, I'm a thief myself, but that's fucked up. No one should have, no one should have this happen two times in a row. Yeah, five dollars? No. I know that I robbed you at knife point a couple of hours ago, but this, this is wrong. Do you remember how much the gluten-free sandwich was? I think, was it more than five dollars? Yeah, it was about eight dollars. I told you, inflation rates are going up. Right, so the, uh, the, the knife man is still, like, the worst in this case. I do suppose so, but he had morals. I guess you've sustained a net loss of, what, like, three dollars after this? I still lost the five dollars. Oh, he, he still got robbed anyway. <laughs> he just made sure that I wasn't going to be alone for the rest of the night and he made sure I got home safely. Oh, that's great. So I guess he saved my life. Sort of, after you got robbed twice, once by him. Yeah, apparently like whenever your body's short on REM sleep, it tries to like catch up on it. I think you can't actually catch up on all the REM sleep you lose, but your body's trying to, and in those phases where it's trying to catch up on it, you dream super intense stuff. That makes sense because I was sleeping like three hours a night because I would finish all my work. I would finish my work as in like, the jobs that I do and then would probably have to do a bit of studying because I've got assignments and then I would have to edit a video and then I wouldn't finish until like 3 a.m. and then I would have to wake up at 6 to go back to work the next day and I was doing How that. How the fuck are you alive? For about a week. That's like the reality of being a smaller YouTuber. It's just like what you've got to do from time to time. It's just the grind, yeah. How long do you sleep usually? Like if you don't sleep three hours? I like to get eight but a minimum of seven. Okay, that's good. Eight it sounds luxurious. Mm. Good. I try to get eight as well. Yeah, don't always get it, but but three. If I sleep three hours, I'm basically useless for the rest of the day. Three hours is alright because that's like two full cycles, though. So like at least it's that. Isn't a cycle like ninety minutes? This is Liam, the grandfather of the grind, talking now. He's like, back in my day, three days was the was the usual. I've been in your exact situation. You know that lack of sleep is like the predictor for every illness you can get. <laughs> yeah, and I'm probably gonna die like tomorrow. Horror, but I've, I've been in your situation. Yeah, I can I can definitely see that. I've been in times where I've been like working full time on a musical or an opera or something, designing a show on the side in between that, but also like at the beginning of uploading three videos a week. And there were times when it was just like three hours of sleep, two hours of sleep, whoops, no sleep. And I will say it made me crash and burn in the end. But, As, uh, you know, that's of the grind. course. Apparently in the US, they're considering right now to classify um, jobs that have night shifts. And as uh, high-risk jobs, basically, due to the health consequences of <laughs> having a fucked up sleep schedule. That's yeah. a really good move. Like, and yeah. I'm surprised that that's happening in the US of all places. Well, trying to. Yes, I suppose so. That sounds horrendous. Three hours and I, I respect that if you sleep that little. I know people who do sleep that little, even if just occasionally and then just function for a while. Like for me, it's just one night with three hours and I would not be able to like put anything on paper. I think that's what I mean. I think I'm usually like my personality is when I'm struggling, just push through it. And then after a while, I just had so many of these dreams where I just thought, okay, now this is getting really fucked up. So if obviously your body doesn't like this. If I keep losing $13 every night, my bank account's not going <laughs> to do this. One night I lost more than $13. I almost lost my life because the more intense dream was when I was driving and then this guy walked up to my car and tried to get in and I locked the car before he got in, but for some reason the lock didn't work and he sat in my back seat and then was starting to inch closer to me 
So then the only way out of the situation that I could think of because it was dark at night and there wasn't many cars on the road where I could ask for help. There was an oncoming car so that was parked in front of me. So I you slowly into ran it. into Sorry. him. Yeah, I did. I crashed into you him. Mad, man. I didn't know what else I was supposed to do. And then the dream ended with the guy in the back seat coming towards me to choke me. And his last words were, you fucking bitch. And then I woke up and <laughs> I think that was when I really realized, okay. I feel like we also might have some other issues happening here. <laughs> so me, like, not, not, to, not to dream read you there, but uh, <laughs> what's with the fear of, of men, of scary men overwhelming I you? I mean, a fear of men is reasonable, but the fact that it's like this present in your dreams is concerning. But it was only during that period of my life. It's not like a usual occurrence. That's why I knew. Do you think it could be like a representation of one of your bosses or something? putting pressure on you, like literally choking you with a deadline? <laughs> no, I don't think it's my bosses because I have really nice bosses. I actually really like all the places that I work for. And that's part of my problem as to why I can't give one of these up because I like everything that I do mostly, or at least even if I don't enjoy it as much, I know that it's good for me in the long term and I know that I'm learning from it, even though it is a lot of, like, is a, it is a lot of work and it is really intense. Sounds like it's you choking you then. It is me choking me and that is actually what I wanted to talk to you guys about 20 minutes into today's episode. Self, <laughs> Self <laughs> choking yourself. That's yes the or episode no, right everyone has been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> no my question was so everyone obviously knows that although I do YouTube I also do work pretty much full-time outside of YouTube as well whereas you guys although you guys do YouTube full-time this is not your first life. I should have phrased that better. What I was gonna say is you guys have had another life before this. I'm on number four. <laughs> The cats, the cats with multiple lives. Now I was going to ask, obviously you guys never, you guys didn't just decide to become YouTubers the moment you were born or the moment you guys wrote down what I want to be when I grow up. Actually Manu, you might have. I, I think Manu might have, yeah. I was sliding down the uterus like, YouTube, here we come. But like if I recall correctly, this is your first actual job. I mean, I, I started my YouTube channel while I was still doing my masters. That's so crazy. I'm not sure if I shared this on the podcast before, but yeah. I'm, do you know that, Sophie? I think we have because I, I feel like I've heard it multiple times, but maybe that was just in private. <laughs> You've definitely told us that you started YouTube whilst you were doing your masters and what you were doing your masters about. But I also, you've also told us that you studied business and that you did a marketing unit. I don't know if you majored in marketing or if you just did a unit, but I know that. And that's what I mean. You guys, you, you even though you, this is your first actual job, you obviously also studied and it's not like you studied YouTube at university. At YouTube university. In five years, that'll be a course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it might very well be, honestly, given given how everything um, goes. That'd be fun. Maybe like online digital video production or something. This is a thought that has genuinely crossed my mind because I generally do enjoy teaching people things. And I was like, if ever there was like something similar to like a social media course or something YouTube related, like later on, maybe. I don't know. That sounds like a lot of fun teaching at university. Where you get to like retire as a 50 year old professor with like all of your gold play buttons behind you. <laughs> it would be a lot of fun. It would mean that you would have to stay so relevant. Like you would have to stay on top of so much crap because everything changes. Yeah, one of those professors with like uh, this like khaki colored suit and like a red bow tie. Oh, you like the tweed jackets. Like you're very stereotypical professor. And then a cigar. I mean, no, the pie. The pipe. Yeah. <laughs> like fucking badass. <laughs> All right. Here's what you gotta do. Listen here. Here's what you gotta do. Here's the numbers. You wanna get the CTR up on this line here. Like an advertising executive in the 50s. And if the average view duration <laughs> is about here, you want this curve. That's where you get the money. This you is. Get the CTR, the duration. <laughs> Good video. Just smush. Banger video. <laughs> banger. <laughs> Professor yeah. Banger. Yes, right. that should be the name. I mean, that's a channel name. It's also. Uh, it's probably also a porn up username. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. But really though, did you actually go into university thinking I'm going to start YouTube? No, 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 no. This is funny. This is like something that, that I always uh, shock people with. Um, who do YouTube themselves or are somehow involved in the in the um, in the community? Not only was I not familiar and into the anime community at all when I started YouTube, I was barely 
familiar with anything YouTube when I started YouTube four years ago. Yeah, yeah. I remember my sister, like, uh, like uh, my sister talking about YouTube and everything, and like, oh yeah, like there's so many channels you can watch and this and that. And I was like, YouTube. I'm like, I don't, I don't really care. Uh, I prefer video games. <laughs> so I got into YouTube relatively late. I think um, during maybe during the late phases of my bachelor where I started watching stuff um, and that was really purely out of procrastination because I remember I was like studying and working on my bachelor thesis and um, sitting in this room and I was like I need a break <laughs> and I kind of was looking for places to watch stuff and then I got hooked on YouTube that way uh, relatively late and then I I watched a lot of and listened to a lot of YouTube while I was here in Japan for the first time uh, in 2018 and that's kind of when I really fell in love with the idea of starting a channel myself I was always really into into films and filmmaking and all that stuff and um, I don't know the idea of just grabbing a camera making any sort of video content was just very fascinating to me so Fun, fun fact, I was also never planning to become an anime or One Piece YouTuber per se as well. I just wanted to start YouTube and anime happens? and One Piece was just something I was very much into at that point. But if it had been something else, like, I, it could have also gone towards, like, photography or something. So that was more of a coincidence, really, than, than planned. Mm. Basically, you went with the uh, the popcorn idea. You put the uh, the kernels on the pan and whichever one popped first. And one popped very quickly. I mean, I never tried tried making other content so I mean now right now I am but before like that it was the first attempt at YouTube and I just kind of stuck yeah wow I mean I'm really surprised to hear that you really didn't spend a lot of time on YouTube at all because the amount of growth that you've had then is phenomenal I mean I would say the same I was never really into YouTube even now I don't think I spend as much time as I should but I also don't have the time to spend as much as I should oh, now I definitely do <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I do feel a little bit bad about but not not like I should feel bad about but not really like I spend most of my time on YouTube rec recreationally I would say as a viewer and as a fan just watching things I enjoy while I think in theory it would be better to be on YouTube and look for inspiration and how other, other people do things but I don't know I just uh, but but those things you like surely act as inspiration because that recreation is important and then you pick up on they they do but I never do you ever sit down and watch a video and you're like oh that was a fantastic hook like let me let me see what I can get away from it that's yeah. that's what you should do but I don't do that Absolutely. <laughs> that was my point <laughs> what kind of videos do you watch for recreation everything like I, I still like a lot of mostly educational stuff I think that I watch educational stuff is perfect like that's right up the alley of helping us because that field is so far ahead of like where our niche is I watch educational stuff and I'm like damn like the way the information is being presented right now is like so clear and smooth and hooked me. Basically, I feel like anything that has my attention, I can learn from because I'm paying attention to it. And I think as Manu says, that is really how we should be. <laughs> But it's not. <laughs> I think I'm also on the side. I'm probably guilty of not putting that into practice myself as well. There's something to be said for just enjoying yourself and letting go because that's what your viewer is meant to be doing as well. So it allows you to understand that experience. I, so I, I applaud you for doing it. It's not on purpose. I just think though. <laughs> Even better if you do it passively. Yeah, you're just trained to do so. This is why you get to you're able to release three, four videos a week and on one million subscribers, I guess. Exactly. So kudos to you, sir. Yeah, because I I basically live and breathe this. I do not want to think about how many hours a day I spend on YouTube. I just I just don't. <laughs> it's pretty much always open in a tab. Do you mean just watching content as well? Making, watching, having stuff on in the background. Like YouTube is my primary life thing. <laughs> well, it's actually funny that we we're talking about that because um, to kind of change the subject just a little bit. I'm not sure if you saw it on Twitter. But I did get YouTube Premium. You did. <laughs> You've crossed over to the dark side. Yes, I have. And I will let me tell you that this was no easy decision. So first of all, just from a creator's perspective, I'm very salty that YouTube doesn't give you an automatic YouTube Premium account when you at least hit like a certain amount of subscribers. I mean, fair enough that you don't give it to everyone who just, you know, has a YouTube channel. But I feel like if you get like a silver play button or 500,000 subscribers or even a million subscribers, but I feel like at least give your creators the chance to watch more educational stuff on YouTube for free. So I don't know. It wasn't really about the money. It was just salty about that not being a thing really. Plus, on top of that, um, YouTube Premium is fairly expensive. So in Europe, I think it's 16 euros a month, which is quite a lot. 
Um, I'm not sure what it is in the US, but I came back to Japan and saw that in Japan, it's if you buy the yearly version, it's like 11,000 yen. And with the yen being terribly bad, <laughs> being like dreadful right now, I'm not sure what it comes down to, but it's not that bad. I think it's, uh, let me see, I wrote it down somewhere. Apparently it's like $15 a month. 15? That's a big difference from 60 euros. 16, 16, not 16. Oh, okay. I thought you said 16. <laughs> and I was thinking this is the most expensive subscription I've ever heard. That's more than Netflix, I will say. Yeah, so in the Japanese version with the way the yen is going, and if you if you did the annual one, which I did for like 11,000 yen, um, I'm coming out at roughly 6 euro 40 a month, which is way more affordable. I don't know. I've been thinking about it forever and I feel like I've always told myself because, you know, other than like Netflix or something, YouTube, it's technically still free. You have access to all the content. You just have to live through the ads. And I've just gotten so accustomed, like everyone, like the ads being a part of YouTube. I never really thought about it much. It's just something that's that's there and it's, it's kind of part of the experience. Don't inform people about them. I guess so. <laughs> they, just, they don't exist. They're just part of the experience. Ooh, I mean, me as a viewer, like, I've, I've just kind of always accepted them. And I still don't think they're a big deal. But just recently, I've realized that YouTube has been kind of increasing the amount of ads. Which you yes. would think as a YouTuber, great. Only that everyone I talk to so far has seen no increase in their, in their revenue. So I'm not quite sure where the money goes for these extra ads that they're putting. Like, quite non-consensually as well. Back in the in the days you would be able to select like, okay, I want to put a pre-roll on this video. And so it would select like either a five minute skippable or a 15 second unskippable, whatever settings you've got. It YouTube draws them out at random. It's like on an auction system. But now you put a pre-roll on your video and you will get without fail, like two ads in a row. Like I've even heard that some people get three in a row. Oh yeah, I've, I've seen apparently like there was a, I'm not sure if you saw that. That was also on Twitter where a couple of people shared that um, YouTube was, I mean, YouTube, in case you're not familiar, obviously YouTube as a giant company, I think you don't think about it that much as a viewer, but they run A-B tests and like experiments constantly about everything for creators. And since YouTube's primarily goal is still to make money, they run a shit ton of experiments on how many ads are people willing to watch and what type of ads and so on and so forth. And apparently there has been one cohort that they did recently where they showed five unskippable ads <laughs> in front of videos. So there have been like screenshots and a couple of people like I think accumulating it on Twitter somewhere Five or might have been Reddit. On skip in a in a row or in just a row. the video? No, in a row. No one is sitting through that shit, surely. Yeah, who did that? That's why I don't watch Crunchyroll, because that's the kind of shit they pull. Yeah, maybe they selected just a few people and were like, all right, let's let's see if they eat it or not. But apparently that happened. No. And so I kind of noticed I didn't have it that bad, but I definitely noticed the acts getting longer, there being more unskippable ads, and so on and so forth. And as we just discussed, we are all watching, or like at least you and me, Liam, we're watching a lot of YouTube every day. So after months and months of me going, I kind of want it, but I don't want to buy it for like, I don't know, just being stubborn. And so like yesterday, I was just like, okay, fuck it. This is annoying. I, I like, I canceled my, uh, I had like a Disney Plus subscription for two months, I think, or three months uh, when... Um, the the Star Wars stuff was going on. And I was like, oh, I don't really need Disney Plus anymore. So I canceled that like a month ago or something. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I, I was kind of trying to reduce the amount of subscriptions I have. <laughs> but I guess, I guess I'll put another one on top. And so I got YouTube Premium. And the experience since yesterday, I, I, try, I described it on Twitter as taking a really clean shit where you like wipe afterwards and there's nothing there. Or it feels really wrong but also so, so satisfying at the same time. It's the strangest experience just clicking on every video and it just starts playing. And I close my phone and I put it in my pocket. And I really don't want to sound like this is sponsored by YouTube. I wish it were, but... Uh... I completely get you. That is the one thing that is tempting me to get YouTube Premium. I hate it when I'm taking my dog on a walk and I'm like listening to a YouTube video, a podcast or something, and I put it in my phone, the phone accidentally turns off and then the video just stops because it just won't play because that that's behind a paywall. Fuck you for that. It just should, it should be native to the app, but you know, it's going to entice people like me to pay for it. So I get it. I'm going to say that I am on the other side. I watch YouTube for the ads. <laughs> yeah, I'm that's all I, that's actually I what I enjoy. And, uh, yeah. I, I, like I told There's you guys, I don't watch I was in that cohort. I, <laughs> so I was like, sitting there through the five ads like, can I get another three, please? That will really hit the sweet spot. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't actually bother me that 
much. I don't know if it's just, yeah, I don't know if it's because I grew up never having Foxtel or anything when I was younger. And so I've just become very accustomed to watching ads. Can I just say the Foxtel experience, cause I did have Foxtel growing up and the ads on that are horrific. They are like worse than what you would have on free to wear TV. You would get like, three minutes of a show and then like four minutes of ads and then like a bit more of the show. Because there weren't many advertisers on each network, it was all just like seeing the same ad over and over again, like Crunchyroll. Like the cable experience is not amazing, was not amazing. It might be also the way that I watch YouTube and I guess just a summary of my life in general, because I don't have a lot of time. I'm often, if I'm watching YouTube, I'm doing it whilst I'm multitasking. You made that very clear today. <laughs> 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 if I need to remind you guys, <laughs> no. Yeah, because I'm always multitasking when I'm watching YouTube, I actually don't mind the ads because I find it a good time to sort of take it as a mini break and then like go run off and get something. Like maybe it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go grab a glass of water quickly. Or I'm gonna like move to this room or whatever. That was the classical um, theory behind ads on free to air television. You've got that like three minutes of ads and that was basically like designed to be the toilet break or get some food, get the glass of water, get whatever, just do what you need to do and come back and there's your show, it's on again. I mean, it makes sense when it's a longer thing and it would make sense say for like one episode that's about 20, 30 minutes, if you needed one break, that makes sense. It starts to become less so when it's like multiple because it becomes really more like every five minutes, which is the same for YouTube. So I got, like, I know we can't complain, um, although we are complaining, but, but even still, like I'm actually one of those people that unless I'm really trying to watch a video for the purpose of just sitting down and watching a video in my day-to-day -day life, I will let the skippable ads play so that I'll just go do something quickly. It's like the meme. Like, you, can, it's always morally <laughs> right to complain about YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I think YouTube strikes a pretty phenomenal balance compared to its uh, compared to its competitors. I think they know just how to get close enough to the line without going over it and really pissing people off. Unlike, say, Twitch. I recently tried to get into Twitch. Um, I mean, I've I've been trying to get into Twitch at various points over my life. Um, I can't do it because as soon as I click on a streamer, like an unskippable ad starts playing, I get bored, I click away, I click another one, another unskippable ad, and then I just go, fuck this, I'm going back to YouTube. I will also say YouTube does have the advantage that, I mean, most creators, or at least creators who sort of make a living and so, sort of have success on YouTube have all figured out that you need to start entertaining your audience very fast or they'll want to watch something else. So if actually there is two, two, skip, two uh, unskippable ads on YouTube, you're like, okay, but the ads are over and it's like, firework! It's like, ooh, fast cuts, epic music. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Yeah. While on Twitch, you watch an unskippable ads and then there is the dude just taking a piss somewhere and like, it's like an empty chair and you're like, wow, no, thank you. Potentially complete silence. You just hear keyboard noises and some gameplay and it's like, huh, did you see that shot I just made, guys? <laughs> Man, and, yeah. You're a natural. Yeah, you've got it down right pat. Thank you, yeah, I, I I understand the lingo. You should be Professor Banger Streamer. Can I just say, I have thought about streaming and I do have a potential stream name if it was going to like piggyback off my current brand. It would be Grand Live Review. Ah, very smart. Wow. <laughs> Don't you Sophie wow me. <laughs> Only Sophie can wow. I'm sorry, Manu Factor. If ever, <laughs> if ever we do have like a live stream version of this podcast, obviously, a member exclusive chat by the way if you don't know you can become a member of this podcast and get exclusive content too it's very exclusive our editor please insert all the fantastic member only videos right here that people can watch so if we had like a member only uh, live chat we definitely need an emote that's just wow <laughs> yeah we talk about some very special stuff in those members videos the last one we did was quite off the rails <laughs> very racy okay just to tease it liam started a conversation with so guys, what's your top three favorite porn categories? And then we said, bleep, bleep, bleep. And then, yeah, you're gonna have to become a member <coughs> plug to um, watch that one. Yeah, it was a good time. What were we talking about? <laughs> I can't believe when you, uh, when you did the thing in the special that you have to pay for. <laughs> yeah, speaking of paywalls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of paywalls, yeah. we have our own. <laughs> Another reason why I'm sort of not really keen on getting YouTube premium is because I sort of value understanding the ad experience. And like, I... <laughs> 
I don't want to use the word enjoy because I definitely don't enjoy it, but I find it fascinating when I'm on a channel that I like, maybe it's like a gazillion times bigger than I am. I find it interesting to see where they choose to put the ads and how many ads they choose to put in. And I find that I learn bits and pieces from that. So again, explaining it to, to the audience who don't have any experience with them, um the behind the scenes of YouTube. In the monetization section, whenever you upload a video, what happens is you can basically choose, as Liam explained earlier, do I want a pre-roll, which YouTube apparently also, like even if you don't monetize your channel, YouTube still might put pre-roll ads on your videos. That's shit. Sure. You can choose that. You can kind of choose what types of ads you want. I think there's like for the five people who watch YouTube on the desktop, there's like banners. Um, otherwise it's usually skippable, unskippable ads. Skippable, unskippable, like in the top right corner sort of stuff. Well, you can put an advertisement when the video is over. Basically, you know, someone just left their, which just happens basically when someone leaves their phone and then the ad or on the, on the TV and the ad just runs after the video is over because usually you just click away. But then what you can also do is you can basically put mid-roll ads in between the video, as many as you like, wherever you want. However, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, Liam. Just because you put, for example, three mid-roll ads into a video doesn't necessarily mean that YouTube shows these ads. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I'm very familiar with it and I'm also very glad they do it. Um, you could put 10 mid-roll ads into a 10 minute video. Someone could go through that and not get hit by any of them. Unlikely. Uh, it's unlikely, but you could also get hit by all 10 of them as well. Like it just depends how YouTube chooses to do it. There is a life hack because YouTube kind of has a user profile of every viewer, of every user. And it kind of knows you, like personally for you, for you as a viewer and individual, they know how much they can throw at you barely so they don't push you away from the platform. <laughs> So one lo little life hack I found out is if you just close and open the video like 10 times, at some point you can watch it without the ad. Now, arguably, you could say in that time you could have just watched Cut the that. ad. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a lot of effort. <laughs> but I've been there and it works. <laughs> was it worth it though? That is so much effort, Manu. I, you know. I still feel like a bit cheeky when I do it though. I'm like, <laughs> game the system. <laughs> For me though, personally, I don't find a YouTube subscription where the only thing you're getting is the removal of ads as much value for money as say other platforms where even Crunchyroll, even though you can watch a lot of things for free on Crunchyroll, you get one, the ads are a lot more pervasive as I think we've discussed in a previous episode. And two, there are some series or some episodes that you can't watch unless you're a premium um, premium account yeah, holder. Or episodes that they offer like a week and then they open it up to right. the, the free accounts the week later. Yeah, something like that. Whereas YouTube doesn't offer any sort of service like that. And I think maybe it also has to do with the fact that YouTube has always been a platform where I've just had to deal with ads, so it doesn't bother me as much. Whereas I've heard that Netflix is considering whether to bring in ads for their platform. <laughs> On top of their subscription, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, or massively change the pricing for subscriptions so that people can't share like family accounts anymore. Go on, continue to kill yourself. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if, I mean, I think if Netflix brought in ads, I would be highly incentivized to stop my subscription and it's not even my subscription but i would Absolutely. encourage whoever's paying to stop their subscription if i'm paying for anything i want zero ads Absolutely zero. So I have a great example for this. Um, I can speak for other skies. I, I know. I think you in Australia have Sky too, and obviously there's the original British Sky, but there's German we Sky too. Sky. Do indeed have a yeah. Sky. And they basically, for the longest time, had a monopoly yeah. on on everything football. Um, slash soccer for the American fans out there related. Mm, Sky Sports. Which is something I'm still very passionate about. So me and my family, especially my dad, like we, we still have a Sky subscription, but maybe like five or six years ago, like it used to be, as it's on most other channels, you pay a, a shit ton of money for it so you can watch the games. But then when the game happens, you have a bit of advertisement, the game starts, then there's maybe one or two ad breaks, then analysis throughout the break, the 50 minutes break, and then the game continues. What Sky Germany started doing, not only did they overcharge horrendously, they started showing, like basically filling the entire break, just, it was just 15 minutes ad break between the entire match. Or like it was 15 minutes interrupted by 20 seconds of showing like a few highlights or something. And then what they started do doing next was, during the game, they would shrink the actual screen smaller and have a side roll banner ad running every like five minutes, which was the point where I was like, you found, I didn't know there was a formula to make 
me loathe a television provider, but you found that <laughs> formula. Channel 7 used to do, our Channel 7 in Australia used to do that a lot with the Australian Open, a uh, big Grand Slam tennis tournament in January. What they would do is super sneaky, right? So there would be a match on like Rod Laver Arena, and then you wouldn't even know that it had cut, but they had cut to an ad they had filmed on that arena. So like you spent five seconds before realizing that you were in an ad and then they took you back to the game. It, it was, yeah, I hated it, it was very sneaky. Do you lose game time? Because these games are playing live. Yeah, you like, are. Well, they're going on live. Yeah, and sometimes they do it, Manu says, where like they, they make the screen a little bit smaller and then they put up an ad for like whatever shitty fucking shows on Channel 7 at the time. Do you feel the same way about YouTube? Because like usually as a creator you kind of like incentivize or like I think the general the general uh, wisdom is or I feel like there's two wisdom there's two sorts of philosophy or schools there where you kind of kind of like there's the people who are like I want to make very clear that now there is an ad break and then so you are aware it's happening and then you know skip forward or whatever or watch it and then we continue with the content and then the other school of philosophy is kind of like let's make the ad integration as you said so smooth and so seamless that you don't even realize an ad has started until like 20 seconds into it at which point it's almost half the, over the third school of thought is sprinkle the ads in the video and just don't give a fuck <laughs> that's like the less great one. I'm school two, where I try to make my integrations very smooth. And I think people enjoy that a lot more, but I also will put, uh, what is it, chapters? You know, where you can mark the video so that people can skip over it? Because people get very mad if you don't. A lot of my contracts say you can't like make a sponsorship chapter, like you can't designate the space for it. For example, one thing I had for the longest time is I would have this little yellow bar that would just kind of run like like YouTube does. I've seen oh, that. I watched that. that. No. Yeah, <laughs> and, and yeah. at some point they were like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. Yeah, bad <laughs> And I was like, but people really like it, and they're like, well, they really like it because they can skip us then. And I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> I feel like it's easier for us because we know exactly the sort of length that the sponsorship is going to be, so we can go, all right, let's skip roughly seventy seconds ahead, and it'll probably be done by then. I don't know. I mean, like in a in a perfect world, I I do envy channels that get sponsored by stuff that actually matters because that's obviously the most luxurious form that some that a company pays you what do you what? well let's say you're a travel channel and you get sponsored by like a backpacking company or whatever and it's kind of like this this makes sense for my content I suppose unfortunately in the world of anime entertainment pretty much nothing matters at the same time I I don't mind like I know Mina you've made often you've often made jokes about us doing raid ads which I'm guilty of doing as well guilty but the way that I see it is I don't really mind like I obviously don't care whether any of like whether any of my viewers actually subscribe so that raid is more likely to come back to um sponsor me again because the way I see it I don't like I my videos obviously aren't at the same level as you guys are and so that's really um, a lot of the times like sponsorship is where I get a, like a big chunk of money like a big bulk of money and I use that to pay like thumbnail artists and things like that and so even if people skip it it's like the way that I see it is just like this is how I have to fund the channel yeah I think that's absolutely fine I, I just think every creator kind of has their own line where they say yes or no to sponsorships and my line has also shifted like at the beginning I was very much I was very intent on like no I'm only going to do sponsorships like products I use and then I was like okay there's not that many <laughs> products out there that I use <laughs> <laughs> that also want to have a sponsorship on my channel so I loosened that up a little bit also over time but there's still like certain things like I still get inquiries that are good money where I'm like no uh, <laughs> just, I don't want to put my face on this kind of... It depends what the product is. There are definitely things that I absolutely say no to. Uh, and they tend to be more in like the uh, the medical sector or financial sector or stuff that just sounds really sketchy. Or what is also problematic, what I only learned this year or maybe la or like late last year is there's a lot of these companies out there that kind of look very legit that sell anime merch, but 90% of them don't have the IP and it <laughs> yeah. really, no, yeah. Oh, of legit. course not. <laughs> And it's like, we, I, like, I don't want to drop any names, but it's like big, like I was shocked. Like, it's like bigger companies that you probably know that make probably very good money. And yeah, so yeah, it's, it's stuff like that where I'm like, mm, don't want to necessarily put my face on that. And then I don't know, Rage at the Legends. Maybe it's just because I've been kind of, I've been reading too many comments on videos that did 
fringe and legend sponsorships. Maybe I'm also like, just, I don't know, but I'm like, ah. Raid has become a, a wonderful meme on my channel now because of the bathroom story I told. And now it's like Raid bathroom legends <laughs> if I do an integration with them. Well, that's good that you found like a way to make a good spin on it, I guess. But also I think the way to go about it is, I mean, Sophie, you're probably unintentionally doing this, but every dollar I make on a sponsorship that doesn't go towards me being able to urinate, I immediately like pump back into the channel. That's why I'm able to hire like a gaggle of artists at any given time. And I've got three editors on the books now as well. Yeah, exactly. It's capital to grow is what sponsorship money is. And that's why I'm much more okay with saying yes. Yeah, and at the same time, like I really don't mind if people don't go through and actually, that's, a, my, that's my point. Like I don't necessarily need a sponsor where I genuinely believe in the product or want people to use it. If I find one, that would be great. And I would love that. But at the same time, I don't necessarily want to actually ask people to spend money on buying this product or go do this or whatever. Because as long as it funds me as long, and as long as I can continue the channel with that money, like that's where I would prefer to leave it. Yeah, I will say like on, on, on that note, um, without throwing around any numbers, but with the sponsorships I do, and it's like two, two to four a month, I don't break even on the people I hire. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't, I'm not able to break even on my staff cost with my sponsorships alone. <laughs> yeah, mm. it's expensive to have staff, like ridiculously. No, that makes sense. Be lenient with YouTubers who have ads. I 100% believe that. Like good editors, good artists, they cost yes. money. Yeah, of course. Going back to what my original question though was, Manu, you've told me why you got into YouTube and that wasn't actually even my question. It was actually why you started studying business. But anyways, you've had your turn, so. Was that your question? <laughs> that was what my question was going to be. But Liam, why did you decide to go into to lighting or what made you interested in theater? Liam, why do you like lamps? What's what's with that? <laughs> yeah, we need to discuss this. Lamps are great. They're my favorite thing in the world. So much so that I have theatrical lighting software running this podcast uh, set up right now. Yeah, I can change it slightly. Yeah, I've just made myself very flat now. I don't like it. I'm gonna go back to good old Q500. Why did I get into theater? It was because as a teenager, I had no idea what the shit I wanted to do. Uh, I was in the chess club. I was pathetic. Uh, and we have a thing in our high school called Activities Week, where in theory, you're meant to get together with your co-curricular group and you do activities. And because there's only so much chess we can we can physically play, uh, they took us to go and see a play, a musical. Uh, they took us to see the producers at the Lyric Theater, which is, probably wasn't my first musical. It's the first one that made an impact on me. And I saw that and I thought, hmm, could I do that? And so that's what started me down the theater path. But at the time I had no no creative ability whatsoever, so I wasn't thinking of lighting. I wanted to become a stage manager. Ooh, that's different. Yeah, it is. But you didn't go to school for theater, did you? Absolutely did. I did a three-year degree designed for television and theater in a Wagga Wagga. Probably a course that doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore, no. It got axed because it was a shit course. But I did it. It was definitely more focused on design, but it had um, elements of technical theater as well. Like, I went into it thinking I wanted to do stage management. Then I actually did stage management on a couple of shows, realized that no. Uh, and so I needed to find something else. And I really liked turning lights on and off, like so. Yeah, it really gets you going. Oh, Sophie, you have no idea. <laughs> no idea, Sophie. Flip the switch. Oh, yeah. To anyone out there who maybe does know theatrical lighting equipment, right now my external office lighting is controlled by an ETC ion, like a full-sized ETC ion, which is like a relic that I have left over from the theater days. It's it's so overkill. But it comes into a lot of use. I think it definitely helps that you have a good lighting knowledge um, in terms of your YouTube. So I'm glad that it's helped you in terms of your YouTube career, as well as you, Manu. I know you've said that your marketing you Unit. I don't. I still don't know. Is marketing your major? You want to see my marketing unit? I'll show you. You're still not answering the question. <laughs> I think the the European system is a bit different. So you actually, I'm not sure. Are you? Do you have the American system where you kind of like study whatever and then you kind of have a degree at the end? Sorry, isn't that all tertiary education? <laughs> no, like in in Europe, you choose. You study whatever and then you get a degree. No, but like for example, I know you can take like different courses in very different fields and kind of like major in one direction that you enjoy. While in Europe you have to 
to pick? No. Oh, no? You've got to go into the course knowing what you're doing. We choose a very specific course. You can choose a minor along the way, but your major is set in stone pretty much from the get-go. Yeah, and even the minor, it depends on the course, whether you whether you would be allowed to choose a specific minor. Like certain things are just too outside of your realm. Yeah, the way it worked for me was, so it, it's business engineering, so it was 60% uh, business, 40% engineering. And then out of the, you could basically have a, you cho choose a speciality in either of these two or in both engineering and business. So there were like eight to 10 different specialities you could go into in business and then a bunch for engineering. So it was like chemistry, biology, computer engineering, informatics, um, mechanical engineering and so on and so forth. And then for business, like, you know, finance, mine was called marketing strategy leadership and then a bunch of others. Uh, I don't actually remember what the other precisely were. But yeah, so I did that and computer engineering, both for my bachelor's and my master's. Computer engineering. Yes, I can code. I don't look like it, but. No, I would not have picked that. <laughs> it's not Liam the nerd, it's Manu the nerd. I was always a horror, the nerd. You were in chess clubs. It's terrible at chess. Obviously, since it was only 40% of my studies, like I wouldn't be qualified enough, I think, to work in the field. But just having like a basic grasp of like a bunch of uh, programming languages has come in very handy um, over the years with like small things, like small little applications I'd write and like little plugins and stuff like that. To be fair, like when I when I started YouTube full time after I graduated, I was fairly sure that I would not need my business nor engineering knowledge at all. And just two years later, here I am and could not have been more wrong. <laughs> Everything you learn compounds and comes back into play. There's like very few you, um, pieces of useless knowledge. Like it's astonishing just how much of my theater background I brought into YouTube. I never would have expected it. Really? Theater and YouTube, I feel like, I mean, just for me, sound closer at first glance. I feel like marketing and coding sound closer. <laughs> To YouTube at first glance. Well, either of your majors slash degrees sound a lot more relevant than mine because I can <laughs> definitely say that. Apart from copyright, and even then it's not like copyright is a is an elective that all law students have to take. But you can. Did you? You can, and I did. I did, but it's not it's not mandatory. And I don't think law is as applicable. But with your channel, I feel like someone like Legal Eagle would beg to differ. I mean, yeah, of course. It's but then that's what I mean. It really depends on your niche, right? Whereas something like lighting, as long as you are, if you are, especially when you are actually like revealing your face, which we discussed in a recent episode, that obviously comes into play. And yeah, marketing and coding, that does definitely sound like much more up your alley. I'm just asking because I also tutor students and a lot of them are entering their final year of high school where they have to actually decide what university they want to go to, what degree they want to do. I think because they know I studied law, they think I am very successful and that I've got my shit together, <laughs> which is the opposite of my life. And they always ask me for advice and they don't really seem to like it when I say, just you should just do what you like. They're like, no, I don't want to do what I like. Fuck you. <laughs> I think it's just because it sounds so generic, right? Just follow your passions, follow your dreams. Sometimes that's also bad advice depending on the passion though. Yeah, I mean, true. It's like, but all I like are drugs and alcohol. Follow your passion. Yeah. <laughs> But for example, like um, I've spoken about this uh, with my wife quite a bit. Uh, if we do bring Spawn into the world, we're quite terrified that they will like follow in our footsteps down like the path of the arts and say, I want to go to university to study to be an actor because we both know just how extraordinarily difficult their life is going to be as a result of that decision and the like microscopic odds of being able to make something out of it. And it's not just acting, it's like uh, a whole ton of other like arts parts. I like how you said spawned. I can't get over that. My wife just spawned kid in the spawned bedroom. Spawned a child. That was in my uh, wedding speech. I thanked my wife's parents for spawning um, <laughs> Chantel. And uh, yeah. That was, that was good. The reception broke into laughter. <laughs> oh, okay. I think Chantel's father was quite surprised, but um, Chantel's mother <laughs> took it quite well. <laughs> it's about 50%. I mean, yeah, I agree as well. I agree with your point, Liam, and I think I would be scared of that too. I know my mum definitely was because my younger sister wanted to be an actor when we were growing up. And my mum did flirt with the arts when she was, I guess, in her 20s and she wanted to go into theatre. She wanted to be an actor. She also wanted to be a painter and then just decided her mum got really sick 
sick. Her mom got really sick and decided that she needed to follow something a little bit more practical and that would actually bring in money. I guess the thing is like, it's such a horrible decision to be making in high school because it's before you've experienced the world. When I chose what initial degree I was going to do, I didn't know anything about like how much it would cost me to make a living living in Sydney. I didn't realize the fact that me doing that degree meant that I would probably never be able to buy a house or potentially even an apartment. I mean, nor do you care at that age, if you're being honest. No, exactly. I didn't care. I just thought, yeah, I'll just do this fun thing and everything will work out. And to be fair, everything did work out, but I think I'm a rare case. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think high school is such a young age. Even like, even now people just constantly change and it's so hard to find what you're really interested in, whether it's really practical or not, whether it's something that's you're going to love forever. I mean, that's actually why I asked you guys this question because I am sort of at this juncture in my life where I'm very close to finishing this, the PLT, the course that I'm doing so that I can become certified. And then I've only recently realized that even after I become certified to actually practice as a lawyer on my own, I have to work full time as a graduate lawyer for two years, which makes makes sense because, you know, being a lawyer obviously has a lot of responsibilities. If you screw up, you can be personally liable for a lot of stuff. So I completely understand why I'd have to go undergo that process. But for me, when I have, when I also want to still do YouTube, where I'm also liking my other role as a policy officer, which doesn't necess which doesn't technically count as a lawyer, even though there are some crossover and skills that are required, that means that I might need to take five or even 10 years, depending on how many days I want to work as a lawyer to actually become a lawyer on my own and actually and can say that you know I can actually help you out because I'm a lawyer and that's something that no one tells you in high school that you know what the age that you are probably going to become a lawyer is like <laughs> closer to 30. Yeah it's probably the same with doctors as well when you like yeah brutal professions. Can I ask you something very unrelated that has been bugging me today? Sure. So I, I bought something on Amazon today and I got a recommendation for plastic covers for manga books, which first of all, I thought was a hilarious recommendation. <laughs> Very specific, I felt. I have a personally, I, I like, I have a weird gag reflex when it comes to, to like putting plastic on things. Deep throating your manga? Yes, yeah. No, I really hate it. Like it makes me nauseous when I see, you know, stuff covered in plastic to protect it. So I kind of, and I feel like that opens up kind of a larger field of, you know, some people like in England, for example, it's very common that people put like plastic sheets on their furniture so it doesn't get, you know, bad and stuff like that. Or yeah, like if you're an old nonna, yeah. absolutely. And then on the other hand, you have, of course, for example, like if you have like collectibles, Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon cards, you will probably put them in like sleevers or something. Oh, you've got to keep them in plastic. Absolutely. And then in the middle ground, you have things like, um, for example, your books. Do you try to like, there's the, there's the people who just try to, you know, they use their marker and like the book should look the way it was like, it should, it looks like it was bought yesterday when you finished the book. While there's like people like me who grind through their books and they basically look like they've, I've bought them like 50 years ago when I'm done with them. Yeah, and dogs chew through it. What's your thoughts on that? Where do you see yourself on that spectrum? Cause it's something for some reason I thought a lot about today. I am 100% a grinder. I love books that look red. If they look all shiny and new, they're worthless to me. I like nice. seeing something used in red. That's an interesting take because I am very much a grinder. Triple grinders. Like instead of using bookmarks, I will, I, like I don't mind folding the page in half to mark my, mark where I am, where I'm <laughs> placing the book. Yeah, why? What's the problem with it? But then I wouldn't necessarily say it's because I like to know that I made a mark on the book and there is physical evidence that it has been read. I wouldn't go that far. I'm not saying I go out of my way to do it, but you know. Liam is like, today I'm gonna humiliate this book. <laughs> Let me show you who's reading who. I'll teach you a book. Book has been disrespected <laughs> by read Liam. Get the fuck out of this book. <laughs> <sighs> No, I just, I'm I'm a very heavy-handed person and I, I can't handle things delicately. So after an entire book, look, it's not going to be in great condition. I don't actively go out of my way to. I think it's nice. I mean, Sophie, maybe you can relate to this. But like, for example, because um, I just came back from several countries traveling and one of those being Spain, where I did go to the beach a bunch of times. I think there is something really nice about a finished book that, you know, has been kind of like thrown around the sand and stuff. And it's kind of like all like 
puffed up, the pages kind of like... Adventure worn. Yeah, it has like charm, I think. So I would kind of agree with Liam there. Personally, I'm not a big fan when books get wet and I don't like it when the pages crinkle. You know when they dry and then it becomes wavy? Wavy pages are awful. Yeah. Even when it gets wet just a little bit, like you get pages that sort of crinkle up and they're, mm. they're like wavy. And I don't like it when a book gets to that stage. And even then, that's what I was saying. I'm, I'm someone who can't help the fact that I'm just a messy, unorganized prick, but <laughs> I would like to take better condition of my stuff because it's not just books. I don't think I've ever been someone who takes very good care of my material possessions. Me neither. Me neither, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. For some reason, I really hate, like, that idea of putting a manga into, like, this plastic, this ugly-looking plastic. I mean, I, I'm sure there's people in the comments who are like, <gasps> you gotta protect your valuable collection. And I get that. I just think, like, wrapping something in plastic immediately makes it lose all of its charm instantaneously. And it's similar again, like I'm not sure if you're familiar with that example from England, um, where I ran into that a bunch of times. So I just assume it's common there, but I'm sure it's probably, you know, depending if you're from where you're from and like how, how your parents are, that you might have that in other countries too. But like wrapping furniture in plastic to protect it, like while you, I, I get that if you're like, okay, while I'm not using it, I'm gonna put a put plastic over it and like the garden furniture in the winter and I'm gonna put it in the shed and put a sheet over it or something. I get that. But actually like sitting on a couch that has a plastic sheet on it i feel like defies for me yeah, it's awful the purpose i've never understood it the purpose of the couch does not sound comfortable at all we've got to protect it from being sat on its job yeah literally so i don't know as far as i'm aware the only people who do that are like old grandmothers kind of triggers me grandmothers trigger me as well <laughs> i think it's also why the manga would be triggering because manga is something that's supposed to be read it's not necessarily a collectible fulfill your purpose although some people obviously do just use it as a collectible and i can understand that because as someone who likes figurines I wouldn't want to wrap it up in plastic but I wouldn't mind getting a glass case for example and keeping it safe in a glass case where it's a lot easier where it's not gonna collect dust and it's not something that I have to take care of because I mean surprise surprise I don't take care of dusting my figurines it's probably very very dusty so I'd like to I would like to take care of it like that I mean the you know um, Yu-Gi-Oh Pokemon cards I can understand if people get plastic sleeves for those where Whereas when you said plastic cover for your manga, I was expecting like a nice plastic cover. I thought it was specially designed. I didn't think you just meant like cellophane. Is that the actual case? It's just like clear cellophane? Yes, I can link it to you. Please don't. I don't need to vomit today. Because I've never bought manga on Amazon, I think. So I was kind of surprised I got that recommendation because I always go to a bookstore here. So they look like this, which kind of makes me very sad. They took this really unflattering picture like of a Demon Slayer manga also for, for the image <laughs> wrapped in plastic. What? Oh, I hate it. What material is that? I mean, obviously it's plastic, but it's it says transparent, but it doesn't look very transparent. It's not as bad as I thought it would be, but I really don't like it. It makes me feel like my books belong in a library and therefore don't belong to me. Yeah, you know what it reminds me of? I kind of, maybe that's why I despise it. It reminds me of like, did you have that too? Like at the end of each year, you would like walk down to the school library and hand off your books and then pick up the new ones for the next year. Oh, not like that. We didn't have to do it at the library. We just did it in the classroom. That sounds very regimented in German, yes. Well, we had that and then you'd get like these old books wrapped in plastic. So they would, I mean, they still look shit obviously, but then that reminds me of well, that. Most of our school library books were wrapped in that sort of plastic, I imagine, to protect them because they're going from student to student who's obviously going to trash them in their bags and like that's, that's a bit more understandable. Also, one of my favorite pastimes getting ready for school was wrapping my books in nice paper and then putting cellophane on it and always trying to make sure that, um, not cellophane, it was, um, what do you call it? Just the sticky, sticky plastic cover. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I did mine as well, but I was always really shit at it and had lots of bubbles remaining at the end. <laughs> yeah, me too. And then it'd be a fun, it'd be a fun thing for me during class to try to like move the bubbles to the edges so that it's not showing on the <laughs> edges of the, um, on the book cover. But you could never get rid of them. No, you couldn't. And then you'd use a ruler and then and it would make it worse because it makes it like yes, yes, it yes. crease up and it becomes all sharp. I completely relate to that. So I actually enjoyed that. And I always thought it was a cop out when people 
bought the covers. That the <laughs> sleeves that you could just, I guess, fit your book into, which in retrospect, I guess, is a lot more environmentally friendly because you could use that year on year. Cop out. It's like buying your cosplay. Well, I'm glad that we all established that we're grinders. <laughs> we're book grinders. Yeah, sorry, that was a random, very random topic that just like I remembered that I was thinking about that earlier today. Welcome <laughs> to uh to being an elderly gent, Manu. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Going on unhinged rants about very minor aspects of life. Get off my porch! It's my everyday. <laughs> I'm gonna get a cane that I can go like this with. I think it'll suit yeah, I want you. A cane yeah. too. All right, Liam, it's your turn. What's a random thought that you've that's been bothering you today? Might as well air it out. Oh God, thoughts that have been bothering me. <laughs> Where to Maybe we'll come up with a golden one because the last time we asked Liam this question was in fact when we were shooting the member special and he made us reveal our top three porn categories. True. So true. Liam, what do you have for do you us want to today? Know something? Fair enough. Okay, number one. No. <laughs> Something that has annoyed me recently is my area's uh, attitude towards dogs. By which I mean, I take my boy on a walk and we encounter like a lot of off-lead dogs and not in park areas, on like street areas. And I'm like, you get your dog away from mine. You are so lucky he is not violent. Like you crazy, insane owners, but my dog is not entirely innocent in the neighborhood at the moment. There was an incident, an altercation. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, Sophie, but if someone like walks up to where we live, Puck will start barking. He's just, he's very defensive of the territory. And there was a recent charity drive going around in my area. I think it was cancer research. They were like selling $5 bandanas. And so Puck barked. I was like, okay, someone's at the door because that's kind of like my doorbell. Open it up and there is like this flock of uh, like a mixture of high school and primary school girls all selling these bandanas. But before I know it, before I know it, Puck behind me has run through my legs and started barking at them. And then what I hear is like the loudest set of collective screams I've ever heard from all of the little girls that are like, you know, probably five to seven years old and they all run for their lives. And Puck, he, he's very playful. And if he sees you running, he will like chase you. And so he chased after them. Just all of these girls, except one of them, which was in high school and thought it was hilarious, just bolted down the street and I had to like chase after him and grab him, put him inside. And then I was like, I'll just buy you a box of bandanas. Nice. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and everything was good. But yeah, um, Puck is now, I imagine, a feared legend in the neighborhood. But also, put, keep your dogs on lead. Like if you're not in an off lead dog pot, put them on lead. Something bad is going to happen. Not with my dog. But if you run into the, the wrong dog, there's a reason why some dogs are on lead. I don't want to end this podcast on a depressing note, but your story reminded me of a story, so I'm just going to go there. It's a really good thing. I'm really glad that that's sort of the extent of your story, Liam, because I remember my friend's dog, also not a violent dog, just very playful, but also very active. I think somehow sneaked out of the house, got out of the house one day and went to a neighbor's backyard who also had a really old dog. Oh, Sophie, this sounds very depressing. Yeah, it had a really old dog. And because the young pup was so playful, I think he either picked him up or he was trying to play with him. But the old dog This is really depressing, died. Sophie. Yeah, passed away. <laughs> this is an awful story. My friend had to like petition to the council because they wanted to put down their dog because they were saying that it's violent when it wasn't. Um, luckily, it, luckily that didn't happen and they were able to just, like it was a really old dog and obviously it's really sad, like it's super sad. But yeah, also a good reason, also another reason, make sure to keep your dogs on leashes because you don't know what's gonna happen. You know, um... I actually am one of those people who will look up the um that list of like does the dog die in a movie if I know there's a dog in a movie because I need to like pre-prepare myself for that sort of thing. Oh, I'm really sorry. I get more upset over animal death than human death. I think a lot of people do. I think we're just conditioned to no longer... I feel like there's so many people in the world and we're often... We're just like humans almost just seem like a number now and war is such a everyday, not like everyday experience for us, but something that we obviously know about. And so I think people have become a lot more 
desensitized to human death, which in which in itself I think is also very sad. Yeah, but we've we've escalated the depressing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we also started the podcast on a slightly depressing note, where I was telling you guys about my terrible, terrible life. I mean, you lost thirteen bucks in a dream, and now we're on dog death and global warfare. <laughs> now we're going full John Wick at the end of the podcast here. <laughs> <laughs> I almost died in my on my second dream. I almost died. No one cares. The dog, Sophie. The I'm just dog. a human. No one cares. Are you a dog, Sophie? Are you a dog? Well, then someone say something happy that we can end this podcast on. Boobies. Okay. Oh, boobs yes. are great. Yeah. Boobs are very great. All right, everyone, go enjoy some boobies consensually. Yeah, consensually. Um, <laughs> consensually. Consensually. All right. Okay. <laughs> bye, bye, guys. Bye, bye. Bye. <laughs>